and welcome to episode two of Her Hollywood Highlights with Lexi McKinney and the one, the only, <laughs> Joe Johnson. Thanks Woo! for having me back. Thanks for coming back uh, so effortlessly. So if you are new, last week we talked about Scream and we kind of dove into how Scream kind of set the horror movie genre standards and it, it kind of sticks around and stays with us. So that was really fun. It was a spooky Halloween episode. But today we're going to get straight into it because we're talking about one of my all-time favorite movies um, for a couple different reasons. Um, but that's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I know Joe Johnson here, we've discussed this movie a little bit over the past few weeks. And he's got some exciting <coughs> insights uh, and memories actually about when this film came out. And actually, even before it came out, he got to see something that came to life in production, which we'll get to in a little bit. But first and foremost, I love this shirt. There we go. I love this Rick shirt. Rick F. And Dalton. He is on. He is on. <laughs> yes, he is. So I was telling Joe, I made my boyfriend watch it last night because it's on uh, Hulu right now. I was like, you really need to watch this. And uh, Bruce Lee's in it, obviously. And there's a, there's an iconic scene, <laughs> yeah. a fight scene that goes on. I don't want to give too many spoilers away because uh, I know I have a friend that's going to be watching this a little later. And she has not seen the movie yet. Oh, so wow. I'm going to try to be good and not spoil things. But uh, he was like, who is that? I'm like, that's Bruce Lee. You don't, he, she says, one of the characters says Bruce in it. And he, I guess he didn't think about it. But so, so first and foremost, what for you makes this movie a standout movie, Joe? Well, there's a combination of things. Uh, first and foremost, it's a Tarantino movie. And, you know, he has such an amazing track record and, and yes. you know, Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs and other movies that he did leading up to this one. So, you know, just a Tarantino movie was an event that all my friends had to get together and see, you know? Right. Um, the other thing that appeals to me about it is I love movies about Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, the, the behind the scenes, the makings of, uh, films, uh, that sort of thing. And, and, and then there's just the history of it. I'm, I just love LA. I love visiting LA. I love the history of LA. And so here was a movie that was sort of a slice of life in 1969 LA and it was very authentic. It felt very genuine. Right. Um, they, they, uh, Tarantino had, uh, restored kind of Hollywood Boulevard with the facades of businesses that existed at the time. Uh, and people who grew up in LA felt like they were time traveling, that Absolutely. they were seeing things that were from the past. So it was just a combination of all those things. And then of course, the actors and the cast, it was an amazing cast. Brad Pitt, Leo DiCaprio, Margot Robbie. Uh, it was a great cast. So it had a lot of things going for it. But, you know, of course, you sit down in the theater and you're like, okay, entertain me. This better be good. Right. And I, I loved it. I, I absolutely mm -hmm. loved it. Just the mood of being transported back to that time period and just taking it all in. Uh, the music and the settings and uh, the props and locations and everything just felt very authentic, like this movie could have been made in 1969. I feel for me, history is such an interesting topic because there's some history that I love to hear about, and it always has to do with Hollywood and movie production. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't get to live through, I mean, we didn't really get to live and embark in, in that era and to see how movies have evolved. We get to see what's out now, and we know the behind the scenes of now. But for me to merge myself into this film, there was something nostalgic about it. And it's like it played up to be everything I expected Hollywood to be in the 1960s. Everything and then some. And then it was the cast that automatically sold me. I knew I wanted to see the movie immediately when I saw the trailer. And I knew it was going to be Brad Pitt. I know Leo was going to be in it and Margot Robbie. And when I found out she was going to be, you know, Sharon Tate, I was like, oh, she's yeah. going to be the one, the only. I mean, that's, that's a very uh, hard role to fill just because of how Sharon Tate's life was and what yeah. led up to, you know, a tragic death for her. And yeah. so, um, but one of my favorite scenes and my boyfriend was like, that's what it was like going into the movie theater. And she's got the big old glasses on she, <laughs> and, and he's like, that's what she would wear. And I'm like, yeah, Put it her was bare different. Feet up. <laughs> the bare feet, the dirty feet at the bottom. He's like, what am I watching at certain <laughs> points? And I'm like, you just don't appreciate the art the same way I do. But I just love that scene of, of her going and I'm in the movie. And watching herself on the screen, yeah. Yeah. Kind of an interesting little, you know, I, I have this strange connection to this movie. I visited locations. I got to see some of the filming of the movie. Yeah. Uh, and when some friends and I uh, went to that movie theater, I think it's called The Bruin mm -hmm. uh, in L.A., 
we were like, oh, let's go visit that theater, take some pictures. And do you remember Sharon, the Sharon Tate characters posing by the movie poster, um, the Dean Martin movie. And uh, she does like the finger guns or whatever standing next to it. And she's like, yeah, yeah. yeah." Well, the poster that was there when we visited was the Harley Quinn movie (gasps) with Margot Robbie on the poster. So that was kind of eerie. To walk up and go, oh, where did she Full pose? Circle and there moment. she is on the movie poster. So that was pretty eerie. That, like I said, I've had a lot of interesting coincidences and connections to this movie. Side note: If you know, you know. Joe Johnson is the best person to talk about anything with movie history, anything with cars, anything with unique information about movies that you love. He has never let me down on information that I've wanted to find out or just fun facts that I would have never even known about if it weren't for him being somewhere or meeting someone. Um, But back to that little pose. Please tell me you took a picture in front of that sign. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you do the Sharon Tate pose in I front didn't, of it? I didn't do the finger guns. I was just no. kind of uh, just gesturing to the fact that she was on the poster. But yeah. they let us, the, the theater wasn't open up to the public yet, but they let us poke our head inside. I took some pictures of the interior because she walked into the lobby of the theater on her way to the auditorium there. So we got to explore that whole location and you know that's one thing that's great today with the internet and google and imdb is i love visiting filming locations yeah especially you know from classic films and it's so much easier today to do that with very little detective work you can go to imdb uh search for a movie like once upon a time and it'll give you a list of filming locations and addresses so most of them are fairly easy to find and, and well known some of them take a little detective work. Uh, there's uh, this, one of the scenes I love in the movie is when Brad Pitt picks up the hitchhiker. Yeah. Uh, Pussycat is her name. Yes. And my friends and I were trying to figure out where that setting took place. And mm-hmm. there was no information online. I couldn't find any information online. So as we were l- looking you know, at the scene, we saw an address that was stenciled on the curb. Yeah, And so we just started Googling the, those four numbers or five numbers, whatever it was, and found out that it was on uh, Burbank Boulevard. So Burbank Boulevard. Yeah, so we drove to that address on Burbank Boulevard and found the exact location of where uh, Brad Pitt uh, is uh, pulls up in front of the hitchhiker and she's chatting with him through the window and we're like this is it and it's that moment of pulling up and recognizing the location is really fun when you do that sort of thing it does so was it what was it like seeing it like did it match your expectations i still need to go out to california there's not just (laughs) california there's so many places that i need to go to because i just want to see the scenery. I know uh, going back to horror, Amityville Horror, that house, that is actually somewhere that my dad and I wanted to visit. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it really scares me though, because the, the scariest place I've ever been that I did feel like a ghostly presence was Gettysburg. Oh, we sure. went on a field trip back in eighth grade, and I swear that was the eeriest time. Like you felt chills going down your back. It really was like you were emerged into a, a haunted attraction or something it was such a a weird thing but but same thing with certain locations um what was it like for you and and did it feel lively when you got there was it like you know kind of you you watch the movie and then you take it and you almost line up like this is really where it was shot this is the place or was you know did it exceed your expectations or it was just like wow this is so cool brad pitt was here it, that's pretty much it. It's it's the history of it, and and saying I stood where Leo stood, I stood where Brad stood. You know, uh, some of my favorite locations that I visited from the film were uh, Rick Dalton's house, and when it's like at the end of a, a cul-de-sac, mm-hmm. and you get there, you park, you get out, and there's the house, and uh, right next to the house is the gate. Yeah, where Rick Dalton like h- hears uh, Sharon on the intercom and like talks on the intercom to Sharon Tate. Yeah, that's all right there at the end of the cul-de-sac. Now it's not the actual location where the real life events happen. Happened. That happened in another part of town. Even though they did use Cielo Drive uh, in the film, which did leave lead to the actual location. But the the place where Rick Dalton uh, lived and encountered the Manson family gang. Uh, that's not a historic ac- uh, accurate uh, location. But when you roll up and you stand out and you go, oh my gosh, that's where the car was with 
the piece of the poster that had, you know, Rick Dalton, Dalton on, on it. it. And, <laughs> and you relive those scenes in your head as you explore these locations. So we went to Rick Dalton's house. We went to uh, Musso and Frank's, which is okay. a famous Italian restaurant on Hollywood yes. Boulevard. And that same sign out back where, uh, you know, Brad Pitt's character says, uh, don't let the Mexican see you cry, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. That sign is exactly the same. Uh, we went to some of the other restaurants that were featured in the film. As a matter of fact, one of the restaurants, um, <coughs> Casa Vega, I think it was called, Casa is Vega. where uh, Sharon Tate in real life had her last meal with her friends. They went oh. to the Casa Vega, had their meal, went back home, and then the, the real life tragedy struck. Mm-hmm. Uh, so not only when you go to that restaurant, do you recognize it as being in the film, but then you realize, wow, this is where Sharon Tate had her last meal in real life. Yeah, that's so, kind of a bumming, yeah, to yeah. think about it when you think about it in terms of that. You know, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is, especially when you're playing roles of people that really existed and have passed away, you know, it's sort of like a tribute, and you feel like you have to honor them and respectfully do it. Yeah. What do you think it was like for Margot Robbie to actually play Sharon Tate? I mean, I've watched so many reviews, and I, I don't know too much of the history of Sharon Tate. I know what I need to know, of course, what I got from the movie, um, of her characteristics and her qualities, do you think it was accurate? I mean, I think Margot Robbie is a fantastic actress. She okay. really is all around well-rounded, um, and I really think she she brought Sharon to life again, and that, that really made me happy because you just see all the great qualities about her. She was such a perky uh, and lively person. And- yeah, that's what you hear, like anyone who's known her, and I think that's what Margot Robbie captured was her essence. Mm-hmm. She didn't necessarily physically look like her but she captured the essence and uh, from everything i've read anyone that known uh sharon tate in real life said she was the sweetest most kind-hearted person uh the movie that she was in with dean martin you know Mm -hmm. he was devastated when he learned the news of what had happened to her Uh, everyone loved sharon tate so when you watch once a time once upon a time in hollywood margot robbie captures that essence because you love that character she she just seems so sweet and so nice in this film so i think that's what she was going for and i think she said she had read a biography or something to kind of give her some insight um but i think that's what tarantino and mar margo came to the conclusion let's just capture the sweetness the essence of her personality i feel like they did the right thing i wouldn't have changed anything in the movie um, but speaking of this, so you had a very unique experience watching the film actually be captured in production. Yeah, you know, for someone who grew up in Michigan, this is kind of a <laughs> once in a lifetime opportunity. If, if you live in LA, you probably see this sort of stuff all the time. But uh, I was in LA for a week uh, visiting, had a couple of friends with me, and we went to Hollywood Boulevard earlier in the day, and we noticed that th- there were some crews out there kind of doing set dressing. And so, you know, we're nosy and we approached them and we said, what's <laughs> going nosy. on? And, and they said, uh, we're, 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 you know, we're setting up for uh, filming and uh, we're like, what are you filming? And they, they're like, we can't tell you. And we're like, I think I know what this is. I think this is that movie I heard about Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. So we kind of explored a little bit. We were like, there's a, there was a newspaper vending uh, machine there, vending stand and the newspapers in the vending stand said like August, 1969, like there's so much detail. There were flyers on fences and trees for concerts in 1969 and bands like the doors and stuff like that. Yeah. And so Tarantino just put so much effort into the smallest details that would never ever appear on camera. No one's ever going to see that newspaper in the, the vending machine, but I got to see it up close, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that was during the day. We left. We did some other things during the day. We came back, and we noticed that that section of Hollywood Boulevard that we were on earlier was blocked off to traffic, and we're like, oh, something's going on here. And it was fairly late, and we were tired, but we're like, well, let's check out what's going on. So my friend who was driving the rental car, he dropped me off while he went to go look for a parking spot. And so we go walking up and, and we see the blue Carmen Ghia that Brad Pitt drove in the movie, uh, the, the, uh, Cadillac that, uh, belonged to Rick Dalton. Those are parked on the street and there's other period accurate, uh, cars up and down Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. And so we find a spot where we're kind of standing there looking and 
uh, not a whole lot's going on. And then I had to go to the bathroom really bad. So I, I go find a bathroom. I come back and I turn to my buddy and I go, uh, do you see anything uh, good? And he gives me this look and he goes, there's Quentin Tarantino right there. He, he literally was 30 feet away from us, just standing there, you know. with his You were that people. close to him? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, look at that. And so then as I'm talking to my buddies, the crowd around me, all of a sudden screams out, Brad! <gasps> and the blue Carmen Ghia comes whizzing by, and there's Brad Pitt behind the wheel. And he kind of looks startled because the whole crowd yelled out his name, and he looks startled, and then he waved. And <laughs> so that blue Carmen Ghia goes past us, and then this black SUV pulls up, the door opens, Leo DiCaprio steps out. I'm like, this is one of the greatest days of my life. Yeah. So the Cadillac that belonged to Rick Dalton in the film like a 66 Cadillac Eldorado. They had a couple different versions on set, and one was on a, a trailer that would be pulled by another vehicle. Okay. And that had lighting and microphones and everything attached to it, and crew members were all over the thing. Yeah. So Leo and Brad got inside the Cadillac, and, the, and they would drive up and down Hollywood Boulevard shooting them riding in the car. And we stood there for hours just watching this happen. And How then, could you not? I mean, yeah. it's not one stars, but two of the most iconic stars. The and master, one of my favorite directors. Yes, yeah. the master behind the production. I mean, oh, I'd be like, pinch me. Is this reality? <laughs> this is not reality. But that's just the Joe Johnson effect. That's what it should right be called. Right place, right time. <laughs> just not even expecting it. It's not something we planned. It's just something we stumbled onto. And then as we're standing there watching you know, things unfold, a guy walks up next to me and he starts going, Quentin, Quentin. <gasps> and Quentin turns and looks and it was a comedian actor, Andy Dick, who has been oh, in a lot of Oh my goodness, things. yeah. So he's standing right next to me. He gets Quentin's attention and Quentin turns around and goes, hey, Andy, how's it going? And so they were chatting for a little bit and then I'm like, hey, Andy, can I get a picture with? And he's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I got a picture with Andy Dick. Um, so yeah, it was just one thing after another and it was just so much fun. I got amazing photos of everything going on, all the behind the scenes. I got a video clip of the car going by on the trailer and you see Leo and Brad sitting inside the car. So that was a pretty special night. I, uh, the funny thing is though, is that when the mo that was in 2018, October, 2018, the movie came out in uh, July, 2019 mm -hmm. and those scenes that we watched probably lasted all of 10 or 15 seconds yeah they the were screen. very short yeah. yeah i mean there's the one Shortly. scene where you see brad kind of whizzing by in the car on hollywood boulevard and then some scenes of them riding together in the cadillac but that was it it was very very brief i will say i think once upon a time in hollywood has some of the best scenes driving i oh, do sure. Because every single one, you almost feel the summer air. You smell, you, your senses are emerged into the scene. That's what I love about this film is you feel like you are there. Somehow, some way, because the characterization, because the interactions. Mm -hmm. you're, you're seriously becoming the audience in the film. And it's just a good feeling. That's what I like about it is it was able to capture the true nature. Of course, there were things that were changed in the storyline because that's how all movies have to go. It can't always follow perfect history. Yeah. But it's those moments that are so iconic and keep you watching again and again. I, yeah. I oh, have a, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, <laughs> some friends of mine and I were talking about the movie and analyzing it. And it, it, it doesn't so much tell a story as just kind of immerse you in that time period, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you follow these two fictional characters, which mm -hmm. may be loosely based on real life characters and yeah. they interact with real life characters. Mm -hmm. um, but those characters allow us to explore LA in 1969. And for me, that's the appeal. Now, knowing what happened in real life with Sharon Tate and her friends and the Manson very, family, very sad. that added attention to the film because I didn't know how Tarantino was going to depict that on screen. Mm -hmm. And so here, you know, you're, you're getting to know the Sharon Tate character and falling in love with her and everything. And knowing the real life history, I'm like, I don't want to see anything bad it's happen to really her. It's not really a fairy tale. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. then Tarantino does something similar that he did in Inglorious Bastards. The first time I saw Inglorious Bastards, I was like, 
that's not how it happened in yeah, real life. Yeah, it's a little different. And so he has a little thing where he he depicts what he wishes would have happened, what yeah. what the better outcome would have been, and that's kind of what he does in Once Upon a Time. And the relief that I felt that I wasn't going to have to be subjected to the horrors that happened in real life and mm-hmm. that he gave it this fa- a fairy tale, you know, fantasy ending, I was so relieved because... I really liked all those characters. I think that's what's special about it. I was telling my boyfriend, too, because he was asking me a little bit about what's going to happen. Because it took him a minute. He doesn't have the history. He doesn't know. He's not as into Hollywood, I should say, as I am. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, this is all I've loved. I love video production. I love the behind the scenes. I love to learn about actresses, actors, and what they had to do to get a role and how it was reenacting a role. But um, the scene where Brad's in his trailer <laughs> and he's feeding his dog and he's eating out of his his uh, his noodles, his yeah. mac and cheese, uh, and I'm explaining, I'm like, you know, the ending could have went really south mm-hmm. and it could have been a really ugly ending. Um, but Tarantino, you know, he, he did it, like you said, in a way that audiences would, we would all kind of agree on what we would have liked to see happen in the long run. Yeah. And- now, there have been some complaints about the ending only mm-hmm. because... It's very difficult whether whether a woman is a good guy or a bad guy in a movie. It's very difficult to watch violence against women, yeah. and so there were a lot of people who complained about the ending that there was the movie depicts brutal violence against some female characters. Yeah, and my my defense of that is is that the real life people did some really horrible things. So this was Quentin Tarantino giving them what he felt they deserved. So personally, I didn't have a problem with the violence because these characters, these, the real life people that these characters are based on were so horrible and so horrific that it it felt almost therapeutic that Tarantino did what he did. Uh, I get what the critics say. Like it's very hard to watch violence against women regardless. And I understand that. But in this particular case, those characters got what they deserved. I had to watch the movie It Ends With Us, and uh, this is a little trigger warning for anyone listening. If there was any you know, sexual assault or you have had any uh, issues with this, definitely just want to give that little warning right now. But uh, It Ends With Us is a movie that it really covers um, abusive relationships mm-hmm. and what it does. And Blake Lively is in that film, and she received a ton of backlash at her role because she was very insensitive to a lot of women who this is their reality who they are in a relationship where they are constantly abused mentally physically and there's no way out no matter what they do they're just stuck in this awful cycle and it really makes you wonder because if it were me in that scenario and I was an actress and I was able to somehow play a scene or be a role in a scene with such brutality, such ugliness, such violence, I would do everything in my power to reach out to the people that have to watch that and yeah. say, hey, if you need help or if this is really hurting you, what can I do? Where can I take you? What can I do to give you some form of comfort or therapy or to help you? Because I feel like it's one of those things where it really is hard to see women who have experienced this violence yeah. have to watch it on a movie, in a film, on TV. And you don't realize how that, that really kind of messes with your mind. Yeah. And it ta- you take things with you, and, and, and it ends with us. It was really hard for me after I got out of the theater. Yeah. Because it was so brutal, and I know so many people in my life that have been affected by similar scenarios. And so it, it really took me a second to kind of get out of that state of mind. Yeah. And Something similar happened where – um. When I was living in L.A. back in 1990, I was staying with an aunt and uncle who put me up until I got a place of my own. And I was working uh, during the in the evenings, actually. And I had come home and long, exhausting day. And my aunt and uncle were sitting there watching uh, The Accused okay. by, with Jodie Foster. And I just happened to walk in at the most brutal, horrific moment in the film. And I don't want to go into detail, but it mm-hmm. it messed me up. And I'm like, yeah. I can't believe you're sitting here watching this. So I walked away, went into my bedroom, closed the door, turned on some music, and my aunt came in to check on me, and she's like, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. I just, I can't, I can't watch something like that. It affects me too much. And she's like, I yeah. understand, I get it. So, yeah, for some people, watching acts of violence committed uh, toward women, no matter how, 
you know, comic booky or realistic or whatever, it's very difficult for some people. It's very hard to stomach. Yeah. It is. And it, like you said, it's not the easiest thing to get out of your head. I don't know if that makes sense. But for me, it's like some things I hold on to so much tighter and it's hard for me to let go of it because it just really puts like a damper on your mood oh, sure. and your feelings. And you just feel like you need a hug and to take a nap or something and, and escape what that feeling, what that negativity has yeah. been expressed. But, well, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, one of the most iconic <laughs> movies. Um, I'm going to ask this question after every single podcast because we have to talk about it. Is there anything the one, the only Joe Johnson would change about this film? No, not really. You know what What I really loved about it is if you look at all of Quentin Tarantino's films, it's probably his most lighthearted <laughs> which is surprising going into it, thinking, uh-oh, what am I going to see here? Yeah. It's lighthearted. It's funny at times. Um, the characters are, are all enormously likable. Mm -hmm. um, no, there's not much I would change uh, in the film. Like I said, the, the, the ch twist in the historical aspect of the film was kind of a welcome relief because I don't know if I would have wanted to see the actual events unfold so i wouldn't um, have i can yeah. tell you that yeah so it instantly you know upon seeing it for the first time when you factor in uh seeing the filming and and then seeing the movie for the first time it, it just instantly spoke to me and and instantly became one of my all-time favorite movies and you know like i said i just love films about uh filmmaking and hollywood and history like la la land is is, yes, we were talking a little yeah, bit about La La Land. It's kind yeah. of, you know, more of a modern look at filmmaking and behind the scenes and the lives of actors and musicians in L.A. Uh, the player, I mean, even going back to like the early days of film, I, I love movies like, you know, Abbott and Costello go to Hollywood. Or, yes. Uh, there's a Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis movie called Hollywood or Bust. And uh, I l even love seeing those old classics that kind of pull the curtain aside and you get to see the sound stages in the movie studios and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, growing up in the Midwest, because earlier you said, you know, we're not really normally exposed to the filmmaking side of things. And growing up in Michigan, growing up in the Midwest, the movie theater was a magical place where you yes. went in and you escaped and you were Surreal lost in that moment for 90 minutes or two hours. And I'm kind of glad that I didn't, again, have that curtain pulled in, and living in LA and seeing things filmed outside your window. And then you, you go to the movies and go, Oh, I know where that is in Michigan. It was a magical place. That screen was a gateway to another world. So as I got older and then went to LA and started exploring, it just seemed that much more magical to me. Like, wow, this is where my favorite films were made. And that's why I like going to the filming locations and standing where greatness stood like silly. standing where greatness stood yeah, that yeah. is a good quote we're gonna put that on a t-shirt with your <laughs> hashtag joe johnson quotes yeah no a buddy of mine went out to la with me one time and we're big three stooges fans and we i found, love the three stooges we found a location it was a, a three stooges short called an ache in every steak and the uh, three stooges had to deliver a giant blocks of ice up a long flight of stairs and every time Curly would get to the top of the stairs, the block of ice would melt into an ice cube. Mm -hmm. And my buddy and I found those flights of stairs, that long flight of stairs, and it is virtually unchanged from, you know, 60, 70 years ago, however long ago they filmed mm -hmm. uh, The Three Stooges. And standing there and, and going, this is where, the you know, the camera was here. And the director would be like, all right, you're going to take this ice and you're going to run up the stairs. It was magical. It was magical to go, this is where it happened. So I love doing it. Uh, I'm planning on going to L.A. next year. I have a list of places I'd like to visit when I go next year. And it's just something I really enjoy doing. I will be texting you and bugging you <laughs> saying, where'd you go? What did you bragging. see? Yes. Did you see another film? I mean, Once Upon <laughs> a Time in Hollywood, though, that would be one that I would love to see. I would have loved to be in your shoes and have seen that. Just because, of course, Brad Pitt and Leo. I mean, yeah. how can you not want to see them physically in person? You you dream about them and see them in so many different films. I know yeah. the Titanic for me, I was like, who is this gentleman? Who is he? <laughs> um, and so to see that, but of course the vibrance. There's something about L.A., the saturated lights. Um, the atmosphere, the crowd, you can yeah. like smell the popcorn butter when Sharon's in the theater. 
all of those moments is really what makes Hollywood so special yeah. to me. And even and, though it's so far away, it's still in your heart, you know? It is. It's, like I said, it's a magical place. And, and here's kind of a cool little footnote. So mm-hmm. imagine standing there on Hollywood Boulevard and you see Brad, you see Leo, and Brad's going by in the car or whatever, and you're seeing them shoot the film right there in front of you. Fast forward a year and a half or whatever, and I'm watching the Oscars, and Brad Pitt wins an Oscar for his role as Cliff. Yes, he And did. I'm like, how many people can say they saw an actor performing the role that they would eventually win an Oscar for? Not many people outside of the crew on the set <laughs> can say that they saw an actor in character that went on to win an Academy Award. And that's pretty special to so me. So true. Yeah. I want to know if you knew, and I don't know, you might have to fact check me on this if you know anything else about this, but I do remember uh, there was an article, and I don't, I don't know how true this is. I don't know, again, this could just be fan fiction and you know, people just being in love with Brad Pitt, but I read somewhere that Brad Pitt, um, you'll always see him eating in a lot of movies yeah. and, and drinking in a lot of movies, and it's because he just does such a great job. I think it was about Ocean's Eleven, yeah. right? I think they said, like, you can count how many times I think he's, like, seen taking the olives off a toothpick or something while he's yeah. having his drink. But it's because he just does such a good job at it. I don't know how true that is. I'll have to go back and dig it out. But I remember reading that, and then I went back and watched the movies with him in it. And I see it. Yeah. Even, like, how he takes, he's on the roof, right? He's fixing uh, the antenna yeah. on top of the house. And he's, like, pulling a cigarette out of the box. like, <laughs> And he just makes it look so casual and so great, and he's just such an attractive guy. You're like, he just makes everything look right and natural. It's like the way he can emerge himself into characters, it's unmatched. And and that's really what this cast was, is they were all so talented. I mean, you couldn't even, I couldn't even pick who was my favorite in it. Because, of course, you've got the fictional, yes, you got the fictional characters. You see truth in real life characters, like you said. But there's just something about it that it just made sense, I guess. And that's what makes it feel, I think. Some people, because my boyfriend's like, are these characters real? And I'm like, no, they're not real. Like, you know, it's not it's not what you think. It's <laughs> not everybody you see in it is who you think they are. But um, I can definitely say that you can see there's some mirroring of different people yeah. at the time that were in Hollywood. And yeah. it really was a one-of-a-kind film. I don't think I would change anything just because yeah. I, I love the feeling it brings me. I mean, there are some scenes in it that are a little bit more intense and a little bit harder to talk about because they – reflect some other negative things that have actually happened in history but yeah overall it, it gets it gets a five stars for me yeah. and and it was well deserved that brad pitt won that oscar well <laughs> you you know you were talking about the rooftop scene i remember sitting there in the theater and i'm like this would have been a tough movie to take a date to because imagine <laughs> if i'm sitting next to a date and he's on that roof and he takes his shirt off and i'm like my lord i could imagine looking at a date and she'd just turn and look at me like jeez why can't you be Brad Pitt? Uh, he he is one of the last major movie stars. He's about as big as it gets right now. Yeah. Oh, I 100% agree. And yeah, it's it's something about I know it's like they they have like all the the, the tan skin and the glowiness and the sweat's not really sweat. And even if they are sweating, they still look perfect doing it. And that's what's great about Hollywood is you know you can embrace those moments in the detail like you said it's all about the detail and I think this movie has some of the best details of uh, of out of all the films I've seen recently it's the one that I think it takes the even though it's from 2019 and now we're in you know Five 2024 yeah, yeah. which is crazy it doesn't feel like it came out that long ago to me but no. I guess Barbie COVID came threw out threw everything and, off but yeah yeah you have no recollection of time cuz of covid my m- mind just goes blank i just remember it came out before covid really was a thing and yeah. and, and that was like one of the last movies i want to say it was like one of the last trailers i've seen in a movie before covid because after covid i wasn't going to the show as much right but like senior year of high school i went to the show almost every week with my dad with my friends uh with my boyfriend with you know family whatever the case is and i really miss that but this was a good movie another uh location that i didn't mention uh yeah i visited what stood in as spawn ranch Okay. So where the where the Manson family was living and uh, George Spahn, you know, when Brad Pitt shows up and he's like, where's George? And they're like, yeah. he's sleeping in the house. I visited that location. Uh, it was once known as Corriganville. Okay. And it was a place where tourists can go and watch Wild West stunt shows and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I read at one time the property was owned by Bob Hope. 
And oh. um, and so now I think it's just parkland uh, that has really fascinating history. But uh, they, I guess they built all the structures and everything uh, on that property for the film. Yeah. Now, I had read, and, and I hope I have my information correct, but not too long after I had uh, visited uh, or when we first saw the filming, about a year or so after that, uh, Malibu had their big fires and everything. Yeah, all the forest and I fires. I think the whole Spawn Ranch area uh, was destroyed in a wildfire. That's so, so, sad. so when I went there, uh, uh, I think it was in the early 20s, I went back there to visit that location. All the structures were gone and everything. But there's mountains and hillsides and areas where you can line everything up and go, oh, this is where Brad Pitt punch the one hippie in the mouth for flattening his tire you could see exactly where that happened you yeah. can see the the hill where george spawn's house stood um so you can still see all the locations but that was a really fascinating location to visit as well yeah that's just crazy that you have got to see some of the most iconic places yeah oh my goodness and iconic you got to see the director you got to see two of the main stars of the film I mean, that is just, you're a one-of-a-kind dude, Joe. Right you place, are. right time. Right place, right time. And I'm sure we might, who knows, next time we uh, have a podcast, we might hear more. He's going to Comic-Con tomorrow. That's right. So mm-hmm. who knows Hop-nob who you might see. Celebs, yeah. yeah, very cool. Well, I want to do something special and end uh, the podcast today on a high note. We talked about Scream the first week. This week we talked about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Both are some of my favorite movies. But for this third episode coming up here in the next few weeks, I want to let Joe pick out one of his favorite (laughs) movies. And then I have to go back, rewatch it, assess it, get my ideas from it, and then we'll talk about it. So what movie do you want to do? Well, I think I uh, mentioned to you at one point that I I grew up with movies in the 80s, Mm -hmm. love movies in the 80s. Spielberg was at his finest in the 80s with a Jaws. string of hits after hits after hits um john hughes had mm-hmm. several amazing movies in the 80s so uh, whatever i do pick is going to be from that time period i'm gonna have I'm to so excited. put some thought into it but uh it might be you know maybe we can talk about the films of steven spielberg or john yeah. hughes uh we'll we'll talk about it after the podcast that sounds good. I'm putting him on the spot right now. He didn't know that was going to happen, but that <laughs> makes for the best podcast because you want a little surprise. Yeah. So we're going to have a wild card uh, podcast for episode three. I will say this, though, and I know we talked about this. This is a very controversial movie because we talked about how Die Hard is considered a Christmas movie to some people, and Joe and I say, no, it is not. But I'm starting <laughs> to change my mind a little bit. I, I know, please don't hate me for that. I was uh, on a deep dive on TikTok the other night, and it just gives me the Christmas vibes this time of year. Really? I'm so sorry, Joe. Please don't don't come after me. But it does. <laughs> I don't know. There's something about uh, the Nagatozi, Nagataki, Nagataki pl- uh, Hockey, yeah. yes, Plaza, the big plaza, and, of course, um, Nakatomi. Na- Nakatomi. Nakatomi. That's I was going to say, it's something's I'm not like, right. Na- yeah, Nakatomi Plaza. Yeah. My favorite quote from the movie, all I'm going to say is, now I know what a TV dinner feels like. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a couple weeks from now, I really want to dive into the Die Hard series because I just feel it's right. Um, sure. And, of course, with Bruce Willis uh, having a really ugly diagnosis, uh, yeah. he's always been an actor that's popped up in so many great films throughout history. I feel it's only right to talk about one of my favorites that he's in. Um but, yeah, we are going to talk in for episode three. It's going to be a wild card. It's going to be a surprise. Joe's going to think about it, and we're going to emerge into the 80s, a whole different era that I wanted to live through so badly. Oh, um, I, I feel sorry for anyone who didn't get to grow up in a movie theater in the 80s. Uh, you know, I just watched, uh, last night, as a matter of fact, I watched 16 Candles. Oh, which yeah. It came out in 1984, which is the year I graduated high school. And I started looking at movies that came out in 1984. And I'm telling you, Mm -hmm. that summer of 1984, any given weekend, you could be watching a movie that today is widely regarded as a beloved classic. And that they all came out within a short period of time in 1984. It was a glorious time to be a film buff. It makes sense because you graduated high school, you're an icon, and then all these (laughs) movies came out. I, I I told Joe uh, the other night, I was like, 
something's going to happen. You have to have your own, like, studio. You have to have your own <laughs> film. Something's going to come out of this. He's such a talented... I mean, I'm serious. If you ever watch, I know uh, Joe does all of these fabulous packages for Orion TV, and we are so grateful. I'm so grateful I get to learn from him. Um, but he has ideas, and I know he wants to showcase those ideas. So I really hope something unique comes out of maybe your L.A. trip even. We'll see. Hopefully, hopefully you're at the, the right place at the right time again. But this time it's like, hey, Joe, <laughs> let's talk about this. That would be like my biggest goal for you. Yeah. The cool thing is when I go out there, I meet people, I make friends, and I keep in touch with them. So it's good. It's really fun. As long as there's that networking opportunity, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, for my professor, if you're still listening, do I get bonus points because I use the word network <laughs> <laughs> um, as a com and, and journalism major? Well, this has been her Hollywood highlights. So grateful again. Uh, we will have a wild card episode. More details will be posted on the YouTube channel too. That way, Joe and I can talk and we can l- kind of switch it up for this third episode. And I want to kind of dive into all of his glory, all of the films that he really, really enjoys, and see the perspective there. Because, you know, I wanted to live through the 80s. So we'll see how accurate all these films uh, were and are. And, I can't wait to get into it. But that has been Her Hollywood Highlights, Episode 2, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. We will catch you next time.